Welcome to Bradford Games. This project was envisaged right from the outset as a community project that would involve volunteers, local residents, also students studying for their degree to experience wetland archaeological excavation. Last year when we identified the, the hearth feature, we've been investigating the landscape around it. Mostly we've been um, doing auguring, we've been taking cores, and we're trying to map uh, the extent of the wet lake areas. Richard Tipping, one of the foremost paleo-environmental specialists in the United Kingdom, was invited down to help us with this project. Now without Richard's work, we wouldn't have been able to properly appreciate the limitations on settlement on, on the site at Hop and Wood Bank. For instance, we had a working hypothesis that there was open water in the river and the lakes and therefore that there were opportunities for fishing, communication and so forth that might have attracted people there. Now his work has indicated that indeed we have bog rather than open water so that immediately uh, frustrated that interpretation. I'm an environmental scientist of the past so whereas archaeologists create landscapes with people in them I create landscapes with trees and with rivers different to the way they are now. So whereas archaeologists use trowels, I use this thing which is a peat corer and I can push this down as far as I need to through sediments. Matt, one of our volunteers, is particularly taken to the coring. He's, he's almost become uh, Richard Tipping's deputy and he's, he's taken upon himself to organise the coring at the moment during the summer. OK Matt, let's take the first metre. Can you give us a hand? Shoving it in. One, two, three. Oh, beautiful. Perfect. OK, now we just sample that and pull it out. OK, that, that. Yep. Excellent. OK, so this is a metre of mud from the surface down. What we think has happened here is a provisional model which has been developed from the cores that Richard Tipping's taken and, and the sequences and the sediments that we, we've got in our test pits and our trenches is that we, we know that there was a lake or a river here, um, probably open water till possibly 10,000, 9,000 years ago and then it began to fill in and peat began to form. Now, uh, to complicate matters, the lake level seems to have gone up and down and we do not understand why this might have happened. So now we've retrieved a sediment core. It's a little muddy. This core might have some contamination in it. So we'll take the top off these and have a look at what we're finding. And what we're recording here is effectively this bog surface fluctuating from a peat bog to the floodplain of a river. Neither of these things is stable in a sense. After a few decades perhaps, or a hundred years of flooding, then the river subsides, it calms down, it doesn't carry sediment anymore, and we have peat formation back on top. So the sequence starts from here at the bottom, and here is our surface, and this is by and large just the soil. It's quite organic, but it's of no interest to us really because it's very broken down because the farmers around here have been draining this land for several centuries. You have to go deeper beneath the ground surface before you pick up sediment that we can actually see the structure of. And what we have here at 50 centimetres depth is a lovely peat. The peat comprises things like the grasses and the sedges around here, so the, so the appearance of the bog in the past was not much different to what it is today. 
Within this peat, there are fragments of plant macrofossils, the thin stems of grasses and sedges. There will also be invisible microscopic pollen grains. And the sediments here in this peat bog are formed in layers. So the oldest is at the bottom, the youngest at the top. Some of the sediments are going to be peat, and that peat signifies a time when the landscape was really quite tranquil and stable, nothing happening to it. But every so often there'll be an environmental change, whether it's from climate or whether it's from people chopping trees down, establishing fields for the first time. And those acts can destabilise a landscape. They can change it or transform it very markedly. So we get lots of information from very simple layers of sediment and we build up a story of how this landscape came to be the way it is now. All these organic materials have died in that mud and it's impregnated in that mud. It's, and it's dead beasties. Yeah, dead beasties. Uh, and uh, it, the water was probably very shallow and still, so think of the dying shrubs as the water level rises and so forth. And as the sediments accumulate, they trap pollen grains, they trap small parts of animals, sometimes mollusks, snails that are growing in the lake and by the lake. And as this sequence of lake sediments builds up, it becomes an archive, if you like. It's a library which we can read through scientific techniques. Richard Tipping uh, came out and took a series of cores which we will uh, use to establish the nature of the vegetation about a thousand years either side of the dates that we've acquired from our site. So about 5,500 BC to 3,500 BC. Thanks, it's bottomless. Yeah, really. Strike oil. Mm -hmm, could. Mine. Being geologists, we tend to work from the ground up. Now, what we sampled at the bottom here is a grey silt, grey silty clay at the bottom. Uh, probably nothing but silica sand and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Very fine grain. Oh, it's actually a clay. See what I told you about it? Yeah. Just this is a clay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's now, yeah. what this does then is to turn into this wonderful stuff here. Now, this is this is called a marl. This is a calcareous mud. This one has, uh, well, has all manner of stuff in it. it. It's very finely bedded. It's preserved the plants in it. There are small shells in it of, of mollusks. So what we have between this bit and this bit is a major change in climate. You think, well, this is, this is my interpretation for now, until the next core. Everything below there is a silica, well, it's a silica rich clay. There's no calcium carbonate in this. That's because calcium carbonate can only be generated uh, under very warm conditions, okay? So a change from gray clay here to the marl, I would think is the change from the last stage of the last ice age, which is about 12,000 years old, and a very abrupt shift to a shallow lake, probably. Marl also doesn't, uh, yeah, let me explain what marl is. Marl is the product of small organisms that are growing in the lake, mm -hmm. actually uh, synthesizing calcium to make skeletons effectively. So mm. the bigger ones are the mollusks that we can yeah. whip around, but they are much, much smaller microorganisms. Uh, yeah. So they're yeah. constructing yeah. their skeletons out of calcium, which is free in the water. The, the water depth in a marl lake uh, is usually very shallow. So, that, so we may be looking at a water depth here of you know, three, four inches or so. So if you have a water depth of three or four inches and the sun shines on it, then it warms up very rapidly and that allows these, these creatures to start generating exoskeletons. So the change here is, from a, is the last stage of the last ice age to the beginning of the present in place of the Holocene. Now, uh, in Greenland, where they can count the annual layers in the ice sheets and the glaciers there, they have a yearly record of going back, well, 20, 30,000 years now. Mm -hmm. For them, 
this comes in at about 11,900 years ago, okay? So that is very much the end of the last ice age. And here, it's a very ra rapid shift. Yeah. Now, something else I always like telling students, when y you see this change in the Greenland ice sheet where you have these annual layers, the shift from uh, full glacial condition where, uh, well, I can't think of the, of the temperature values, but intensely cold, enough to support uh, glaciers in Scotland, certainly. The shift from a cold glacial to the warm interglacial takes less than a decade. Okay, so where you can see this measured, the switch is almost instantaneous. Okay, mm. that we started finding this out only only about 1995. We started counting these things and making it. Uh, uh, making these calculations. And that's by, and, that's by and large why people are so worried about global warming, because the shift isn't gradual at all. What you have is a very sensitive system. Yeah. And if you knock it, it shifts into a totally different sort of mode, totally different phase. So the, the entire circulation shifts. It, it isn't so much a change just in temperature. Uh, the temperatures and the ocean temperatures change atmospheric circulation as well. So yes. the, the, the circulation system that we have, where we have westerly winds coming across and yes. we know where we are, that yes. isn't necessarily what happens in the glacial stage. So the whole thing mm. is reorganised, but it's mm. reorganised very, very quickly. But it's uh, difficult to spot when it's coming up, which is, the, which is the problem. But we can tell a little bit more because this now the mile starts changing. It's losing now all the plants. So maybe this is water depth changing and you're getting much more ch much pure uh, marl. These things again are sedges much like the ones that we around here and they're, pe <coughs> they're now growing through and in this material. So again pretty shallow water yeah. for these things. And I think when we got up the top here because Although I'm, uh, I'm wiping across the blade, so, I, so I'm creating some of these sc <laughs> scratches myself. But, yeah. but towards the top, what you start to see is that the marl is more banded, and you're finding that there's more plant material from the peat coming into it. So some of these bands here are millimetre thick things and these are probably annual. So so the creamy stuff, the marl, yes. is being produced in the summer when yeah. you get high temperatures and probably shallower water through evaporation. And then in the winter that system shuts down and organic matter starts starts to be the only thing that's produced in the lake. So so you're probably so you're looking at the annual changes certainly between here and up there. You can see them very clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what causes that temperature? Maybe precipitation, because if you shrink a lake <coughs> um, or, or expand it, or if you elevate it, uh, you get the balance between the marl production and these plants gets knocked about as well. So there's been a long transition yes. from a marl lake to something where we have. Pete. The place where we got the best sequence, we had four metres of sediment and vegetation that had built up uh, since the last glacial. And in this we found the, that at first there was a shallow marl lake and then we had um, greater mud concentrations, the water potentially got deeper, and then peat swallowed it up, which they called terrestrialization, as the, the, the lake became more or less a bog tract as we know it. No bill plant material. Slightly blacker. Ooh. That's a that's a lower water table. As the water table drops, air gets in yes. and can start to decay. Plants yes. comes back up. Another phase. So they're they're almost equal. That's very very. Yeah. I've never seen equal that. thickness. Isn't yes, it? I've not I've not seen that before. Yeah. So we went up to the deepest part of the peat bog at Embleton's bog, and while we were looking for the deepest deposits, we realised that there's a big tongue of clay that sticks out there. So we have another promontory, if not something separating two separate, different lake basins. I hear you're finding some solid geology. Oh, we are. <laughs> yeah, you've got a good foundation for a house there. What was that? It sounded like a rock there. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
I won't share anything, but there's another. Well, this is the soil over something. Hmm. I don't think it's, it's boulder clay. It might be that. After a metre and a bit, it's not turning into something organic. And it's not turning into something <coughs> from a lake. Yeah. Around the bay into Embleton Bog, we have a spit of land which kicks out, cutting the lake into a couple of embayments. On this, we've had geophysical surveying done during the off-season. This is where we found evidence for at least two hearths across the spit of land. We're hoping to put some more test trenches in over there later on in the season. Now, with high water levels in the winter, we weren't able to identify just how high this sat, and it was through a series of cores that we could see that this was clay and it was a terrestrial deposit. Richard Tipping's work on the paleo-environmental setting of the site is absolutely vital for us to understand not only the site but how this region fits into a broader setting of environmental change.